Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. I'm John Martin. And I'm Dean Reverman. Dean, if I told you that someday very soon you needed to uh, Uh go move into a different facility and live the rest of whatever life you have left there. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, But you would no longer really have access to usable internet. (laughs) Oh. Uh, you wouldn't really be able to watch Netflix anymore. It's just not good enough broadband for streaming. Uh, if you wanted to use a computer, you'd probably have to wire it up directly to something. Use WAN, you know, like or LAN rather, you uh-huh. know, line instead. Um, and, and and you might be cut off from your. You might you might actually be there when a a horrific pandemic comes along that cuts you off from your friends and family for a year plus. How would you feel about all that? Well, I'm I'm not sounding too. I'm not feeling too enthusiastic about being disconnected no. from the world. No ability to communicate. No, no energy. Entertainment. It's not sounding yeah. so good. And, and yet, and you know, all jokes aside, that is a reality for yeah. a lot of our, our, our seniors in our society mm-hmm. who have moved into senior care, long term facilities where technology access just isn't what we expect out of our day to day lives. Yep. Yep. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We had yeah. an episode a few months back about senior living technology where we kind mm-hmm. of focused more on the, the visitor management and the, yep. the, the, the piece of keeping people safe as far as, you know, outsiders coming in. Mm-hmm. This time we're going to focus on what's happening <laughs> with technology actually inside these facilities yep. and, and how maybe our VARs can, can help uh, improve the game there a little bit. So absolutely. It's we, a good one. We have Dr. Majdal one with us from leading age. We're going to get into topics about, what went right and wrong last year mm-hmm. when it came to technology, what we learned uh, during COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, what's happening next. We've got a whole generation, the boomers, yeah. that have learned and at least for the most part adapted to a lot of technology that they're yep. going to expect to still have in their Absolutely. later years. Uh, uh, Dr. Allen's going to talk to us a little bit about what to expect uh, from leading age, with how they can help us out and, and the tools that they have available for us. And we'll talk about maybe some of what's happening as far as legislation that might help us get to where we need to go. Lots to cover today. Too. Exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. Should be a great conversation. So all that plus our usual value of the VAR and what's tech connecting with us. It's time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. It's time to get connected. All right. As I mentioned, our guest today, Dr. Maj Alwan from Leading Age. He is the Senior Vice President of Technology and Business Strategy and also the Executive Director in particular for CAST, which, make sure I got this right, it's the Center for Aging Services Technology, right? Yes, technologies okay. in plural. Technology. Gotcha. <laughs> yep. All right. So first of all, you know, Maj, thank you so much for being on the show with us. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, how you got to Leading Age, and maybe give us kind of an overview of what Leading Age does and what their mission is? Absolutely. So uh, it's great to be with both of you today. It's an honor. Uh, uh, as you said, my name is Maj Alwan. Uh, my name is difficult to pronounce. What can I do? I was born with it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training. I have a master's degree, uh, a, a bachelor's in electronics engineering, uh, a, a master's in control engineering, uh, and a PhD in robotics, uh, autonomous mobile robots uh, specifically. But that was in a previous life. Um, prior to leading age, I was an assistant professor at the University of Virginia, uh, here in Charlottesville, Virginia, and that's where I've been working out of our home office for the past 14 and a half years, well before COVID BC. <laughs> so, uh, at, at my tenure at the University of Virginia, I worked on developing, uh, technologies for monitoring, uh, older adults, health status and functional status using passive monitoring technologies, embedding sensors in the environment, and in a daily object that they use. I also worked on developing uh, assistive devices, robotic assistive devices like uh, uh, autonomous walkers, guided walkers, and and, uh, turning walkers into balance and gait assessment devices passively and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I was recruited into a leading age to lead our Center for Aging Service Technologies, which was uh, created back in 2002. And I was actually representing the University of Virginia on its uh, advisory board right from the get go. Uh, I was in the inaugural meeting that led to its creation. And I was a, a cast commissioner. That's the name of the advisory board members. And uh, I was involved with it from the uh, from the start. 
So I was recruited into uh, this space to help our uh, center become more helpful to our members in terms of uh, providing them uh, hands on practical tools. Uh, not only to to be aware of technology and the potential that that technology can can bring into the aging services sector, but also to give them blueprints and maps and actual tools that they can use to make better informed decisions about technology uh, that they need to uh, think about, plan for, select, and implement. Uh, as well as uh, what they th should be thinking about in terms of the infrastructure requirements for all the different uh, applications and how to ingrain on, or incorporate uh, strategic IT planning into their strategic planning process. Uh, along uh, the way, uh, we also uh, collect sort of uh, uh, case studies from providers talking to providers, so peer-to-peer -peer sort of uh, uh, education uh, about their journey uh, in, in technology exploration and technology implementation evaluations and so on and so forth. Not only talking about the, uh, the uh, singing the praises of the technologies as uh, vendors usually do, but also talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? The, what, what went wrong? uh what they would do the next time around or how they would uh what advice they might have to other providers who are considering embarking on a similar journey awesome. so yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. that's I... essentially what we've been yeah sorry that's that's essentially what what we've been doing for the past uh 12 15 years Lots of good stuff in there. And wow. when you think about verticals that, that really have a need for technology and to start, I, I like the fact that CAST is involved in the, the planning, helping folks understand what technologies are out there. The good, the bad, the ugly, I think is what you said, you know, helping folks navigate that really, really important because I, honestly, a lot of technology solution providers are trying to figure that out as well, what's relevant in the marketplace. Yeah. And, so. and if Maj's uh, intro did not make it clear, he's clearly an expert on this stuff. There you go. <laughs> Infinitely more. <laughs> More so than we will ever be. Yeah. Dean and I like to talk. We can always riff about anything. We can find a reason to talk about any subject. Right. right. But we like having people like you on who can help us really dive in and understand the intricate details of what we're talking about. So, so let's get into that. Let's 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 talk about what's happening in senior care and, and long term care. So, look, you know, we all know. By now, everybody knows what went wrong over the last year. You know, yeah. uh, unfortunately, our, our senior population were the most vulnerable to yep. to the pandemic, and especially those that were in senior facilities were in the most unfortunate situations potentially to an outbreak occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of all that, we learned a lot about how. Technology just was not up to par in right. these facilities, whether it was, yeah. uh, you know, being able to offer telehealth options, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was, you know, for people to be able to communicate easily with their loved ones who mm -hmm. they literally could not see for months and months on end. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's talk about, was there anything that kind of went right over the past year? Did we learn some valuable stuff and, and lessons that can help us move forward with technology adoption in these facilities post-COVID? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the the first thing is uh, the the first silver lining that I see is how uh, people embraced telehealth, different modalities of telehealth, not just the simple uh, virtual visit check in audio using audio visual uh, teleconferencing uh, technologies with their primary care care physicians or specialists to gain safe and timely access to address their uh, healthcare needs. Uh, and that, that happened both, we've seen a breakthrough both on, the, uh, uh, on both ends of the equation, uh, both the uh, end users, consumers, uh, a lot of them, especially older adults who were not uh, uh, tech savvy or as comfortable with using these technologies, uh, have found themselves being baptized by fire, so to speak, and, and having to re resort to uh, those modalities to gain access to uh, uh, timely healthcare interventions. The second uh, sort of stakeholder is, of course, we know that uh, especially uh, older generation of physicians uh, were reluctant 
to use some of these technologies. And even frankly, even the younger ones who were comfortable with using the technology, they were not comfortable uh, utilizing it, uh, fearing of uh, due to a lack of reimbursement, number one, uh, inability to bill for some of those interventions and feeling that they're going to be wasting their time. And uh, two, uh, due to the fact that uh, it's an it's an added expense or an added also uh, uh, step in the way that may inadvertently, again according to their perceptions, uh, reduce the volume of patients and reduce and cut into their bottom line, right? Mm. So uh, that the the the, the multi, some in some cases multi thousand fold increase in the volume of telehealth visits is really uh, encouraging and uh, I firmly believe that it's here to stay. And that's thanks primarily to <clears throat> two things. Again, uh, need, <laughs> right? Need is the mother of all inventions. And number two, of course, uh, we cannot uh, underestimate the importance of CMS's flexibilities that uh, were granted under the uh, uh, em uh, health emergency authorization to uh, reimburse uh, for these interventions, re reimburse clinicians, physicians, and physician assistants uh, for these uh, sort of uh, interventions, regardless of the originating site, regardless of whether the, uh, the patient uh, uh, is in a rural area versus urban area, regardless of even the type of technologies, whether it has audio, uh, visual, or just audio, uh, and so on and so forth. And I believe that this is, is this is going to be here to stay uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, the convenience that uh, and effectiveness that they've they've uh, they, they they've seen as a result uh, of using this technology. And that's again, on both ends, the clinician and the care recipient, the, the, the patient. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I think we've talked a lot about it, how telehealth is kind of revolutionizing a lot of aspects of, of care, you know, across the spectrum of care, not just senior care, but but really across. But, you know, it, it is unique though, uh, Maj, in, in the senior care environment where you have this technology that honestly, a lot of seniors probably weren't understanding of, mm. you know, what is this, you know, right. not to overstate it, but why, how is this person showing up on this screen <laughs> right. and when, what is going on here? But, but what are your thoughts about, you know, leveraging telehealth since, since it will be implemented, are there other ways to utilize that equipment, if you will, to, to help with the senior care, number one, and, or their wellness moving forward, like their ability to connect to friends now via video or family members via video and, and things like that. I think it's going to have a better positive impact, not just for use on telehealth, but but a little bit wider. What are your thoughts there? Right? Absolutely, and but I think I think it's actually the other way around because of, in terms of adoption, mm. uh, we've been uh, we we watch adoption and technology spending in in at least among our members, right? I mean, at least among the largest members of leading age who are aging services providers across the whole continuum. And uh, over the past uh, three, four years, we've been seeing uh, significant interest in uh, the adoption of social connectedness and engagement technologies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, like Skype, like Zoom, right? Uh, like others that have uh, gamification capabilities, playing puzzles, playing uh, bridge uh, remotely with a, with a group of friends or, or, or or family, or even uh, sort of uh, uh, streaming religious services uh, from remote places, or uh, sort of uh, having one activity coordinator uh, in a in a senior center or an activity center in one of your sort of uh, uh, communities, uh, but coaching and and working with residents across the whole uh, organization, regardless of of location. Right, and that's actually uh, an aspect that uh, providers have invested in uh, initially, even before COVID. And those that have invested in it actually uh, got a, uh, a, a double the reward, so mm -hmm. to speak, for being uh, forward thinking and, and investing uh, ahead of the uh, of the pack or tra trailblazing, so to speak, because they've used those technologies to keep residents' quality of life 
uh, high, keep them connected and engaged, not only with with uh, their their peers, their coaches, their uh, fitness instructors and uh, therapists, but also with family and friends. Right, that gave them also gave the end users, the, the older adults, more comfort and, and better understanding of what is this technology and what, what its capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when COVID hit, uh, a lot of them pivoted. And rather than you uh, sort of invest in more telemedicine or telehealth dedicated equipment, right? Uh, they pivoted and sort of uh, uh, leveraged the existing technologies. Some, I, I know some, some organizations have used uh, uh, Chromebooks, right? Uh, less under $200 Chromebooks uh, as a telehealth platform instead of the uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars a computer on wheels, carts that have the high definition uh, sort of video uh, capabilities as well as the electronic stethoscope and, and thermometer and so on and so forth, which actually would not only uh, be difficult, uh, not only be expensive, but would also be difficult to operate without a trained, dedicated staff person wheeling sure. it around who is familiar with operating that, that, that type of, of uh, sophisticated and expensive, uh, technology yeah. hardware. Yeah. I think about it, you know, my kids or whatever, they're, they're really adapted playing games and, and having video of their buddies or something like right, that at the right. same time, they got nothing on the aging population. They're going to start doing bridge and whatever. <laughs> I can just see my mom someday when she's yeah. in one of these facilities, still playing bridge with her, with her friends, but all doing it virtually. But yeah. anyway, well, it, that's a perfect segue then into kind of my next question, which is, you know, as you mentioned, we, you know, the boomer generation, our parents, and, you know, let's be honest, we're not super far away. We, yeah. You know, Oh, right, you like, keep reminding me of like, that. We'd like to think it's farther away than we admit. <laughs> we might be closer to that than we were to, you know, right. playing in the schoolyard at this point. But, uh, you know, we've got a generation moving, in, heading into, you know, assisted living and senior living, aging services that if they weren't, they weren't digital natives, you know, and didn't necessarily grow up or spend as much time with us we have or certainly as, mm -hmm. you know, the next generations are going to have, but still have adapted to some of it and expected mm -hmm. some of it. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, there's that expectation now. And I know when you and I get there, oh, yeah. I fully expect to have just as much accessibility Absolutely. and cool technology and, and have it all work on a great network just like I do right now. And yep. it's going to be very disappointing if they don't. So, mm -hmm. you know, Maj, tell us a little bit about, you know, where what's happening with the demand as the boomer generation is starting to slowly move into this world and, you know, not only their own experience with technology as they've, you know, learned some things, but also, again, their children and their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. We've kind of hinted at this already, you know, what is that demand looking like and, and where is it starting to push and really push the envelope for these facilities to, to make some significant upgrades? Well, absolutely. So again, uh, speaking of, of uh, both of you heading there, I'm heading there too. And if we <laughs> find someone who could reverse the process, I would love to know of that invention, right? Yes, so uh, do, keep, right. Keep, keep, keep me up to date if you, if you <laughs> get a guest who sp can talk about that. But uh, with all seriousness, the, the pandemic has actually uh, acted as a, uh, an accelerator for technology adoption among all age groups. But there are two uh, sort of recent surveys, one done by ARP and one done by the Pew Research. And even before the pandemic, uh, right, we've been seeing a, a steady increase in uh, the, the percentage of adoption among older adults uh, of smartphones, of tablets, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? But, uh, I believe that because of the pandemic and because of the baptization by fire, uh, we are going to see a step increase of that rate. So it's going to accelerate even, even more over the coming uh, few years. Uh, and again, it's not just related to, to care applications or health applications and, and social connected applications, anything. Uh, so so uh, from, from learning, to teleworking, to attending uh, sort of educational events and conferences, 
without the uh, the uh, sort of um, inconvenience of travel sometimes and uh, uh, the the added cost of business travel when you can potentially uh, do do something that requires a two three day trip in in an hour an hour and a half of of uh, uh, teleconferencing of course. Uh, the, the, we're going to see, uh, we're not going to go back completely to where we were. We're going to see probably a mix, a hybrid where we can pick and choose. So, uh, that's, that's 1 aspect where we see, we're going to see an increase in, uh, demand. And, uh, if there's anything that this pandemic has shown us is that. Internet connectivity is a utility it's expected. Anywhere, whether you're going into a, uh, uh, a half a million dollar uh, unit in a continuing care retirement community or lifeline community, uh, upper upper sort of uh, class, or into a uh, a unit in an affordable housing, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it is expected. It should be there, and it's both for the residents care, the residents connectivity, and and social. Care as well as the providers sort of uh, uh, facility uh, and their staff. So that's that's number one. But what I I, I worry about is that m some of our providers were caught unprepared and did not have the appropriate uh, connectivity. Uh, and again, uh, the other group that even had the the appropriate infrastructure. Uh, they were faced with a, uh, a step increase in demand on bandwidth, right? Because we were having a, 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 a video conference uh, every blue moon, right? From, from the corporate offices. Now, every unit is having multiple and every staff member is having multiple of these audio visual uh, audio video uh, teleconferencing uh, all of a sudden simultaneously. So they all needed to upgrade their internet connectivity. And by the way, uh, there there is there is a a, a, a law uh, of the internet and demand on bandwidth. It's called the Nielsen's law. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, Nielsen monitored. Uh, high end users of the internet since the early days, since the early 90s, and how it grew by 50% year over year. And that's, of course, is an exponential growth. In my estimate, due to A, the step increase that we've seen and the utilization of the uh, more and more bandwidth, whether it's for streaming uh, sort of uh, applications, video conferencing work or uh, health applications on the one hand, and B, uh, in terms of the number of devices that are connected to your network is also increasing. And third, the demand on bandwidth for each device is increasing because guess why? Because our cameras are having higher resolutions. Uh, we used to have uh, regular digital sort of uh, transmission. Now we have HD, ultra HD, and God knows what's what's coming next. So I believe that that sort of exponential increase is probably going to be 60% or more moving forward from from this defining moment in uh in the, in the evolution of technology so that exponential curve is going to even accelerate and shoot up much faster yeah. so i i worry about those providers whose uh infrastructure is not future proofed and not ready on the one hand but also I worry about society in general. N number one, uh, having the uh, national infrastructure capable of supporting uh, all of this, in addition, of course, to the 5G uh, networks for mobility and so on and so forth, um, and more so in rural areas where uh, it's either not available or completely are unaffordable, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for low income uh, providers. So that's why it's, it is one of our sort of uh, uh, 
technology policy advocacy to sort of uh, highlight those the, those issues and advocate for uh, solutions at the national level. A couple yeah. things to unpack there, and yeah. I'm with you, Maj. When when the pandemic first hit, I was I was certain. In my in my own mind, that the network that the internet was going to crash. Right. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, "Well, nobody can go anywhere anymore, so everybody's going to be streaming." And it, and it amazingly did not, you know. But but uh, to your point, and what I'm hearing from you, uh, one of the things that I think is interesting and that we should all kind of keep in mind as technology solution providers is that a lot of times, and uh, of course, LTCs and senior centers are not immune to the um, to uh, with the finances of a marketplace. It's interesting if they don't have the ability to bill for it, that's an added expense for them. Yeah. So all of these uh, LTCs, I mean, this we're talking about stuff that is not billable. <laughs> so that's going to be a significant headwind, you know, as opposed right. to the telehealth that you mentioned, Maj, where they could, this, you know, with they were able to bill for those times and maybe some of that equipment, I guess, and get reimbursed for for facilitating that during a pandemic. But when you talk about bandwidth, and that's just an added expense. So as technology solution providers, we need to be aware of that. We also need to be aware that they're getting into areas that they may not know a lot about, which would be network, security, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, as technology solution providers, again, be cognizant of that and be mindful of that, that yes, there's opportunities, but there's also, you got to keep the goodwill going here uh, and be an advocate for those types of solutions that are going to be meaningful and still address some of those issues like network security right. like that kind of stuff yeah yeah there's a whole other conversation that we could get easily get into about oh, right. yeah. the fact that you know that billing is what runs the show Any healthcare that that yeah right. that, that being able to decide what exactly level of healthcare and what access to this or that or whether you have telehealth options or whether you or like you said whether we can build out the infrastructure mm -hmm. in a healthcare environment is so reliant on who's going to pay the bill mm -hmm. and how do we get somebody to pay the bill for it that's a whole different conversation I think we could get into but yeah. but Maj you you're preaching to the choir with me uh, definitely about the whole internet as a utility thing I've actually mentioned mm -hmm. that on the show before that you know and this pandemic very much exposed that gap where rural areas or people who just can't afford the same kind of and that's the thing to, too to talk about is like we're not talking about just access to the internet you know it's I, high speed access right it's high speed not right. just some dial up like you know I, I equate it to you we all have water and electricity as utilities we're all we all expect and use but you can't tell somebody like hey you have water but it's going to slow to a trickle every now and then it might turn brown or might even shut off a few hours a day <laughs> oh or uh, your electricity Yes, you've got electricity, but you can only turn on two lights at a time. And uh, <laughs> if you turn on another one, it might shut down on you and you might have to like turn everything off and start it back up again. Mm -hmm. Or like it's it is unacceptable at this point to offer you to 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 say the Internet is something is, you know, a, can be affordable for one level of person, but not for another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, Maj, it's a. It's a bigger societal issue built around that, but it becomes very, very defined and very obvious when you get into the senior space and you realize like, hey, there's a lot of great technology that could and should be at play here that simply isn't because we don't have the basic infrastructure even to get them there at this yeah. point. And you've got to start there before you even get to this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a little bit about, you know, your advocacy and in you know, what you go out and do. So talk to us a little bit about how Leading Age and CAST, you know, advocates for improving these technologies and access. And maybe, you know, let's tie in also because you, you mentioned when we started talking about this idea of utility, with, you know, from Internet, you know, what are you seeing happening in, in government-wise and in organizational you know, development around the country that is that is helping us get where we need to do? What kind of like proposed bills and reforms around access and technology is, is is, do you feel like it's going to make a difference and where are you guys kind of helping get out there and maybe shove some people in the right direction to advocate for that? Absolutely. So uh, let's start with the, with the internet, right? We're advocating for uh, the availability or access to the internet to be sort of global, right? Global meaning for everyone here in the US, right? Uh, including low income seniors, uh, including in rural areas and uh, in affordable housing, right? You cannot expect someone who is on uh, living on social security to choose between medic paying for medicine and paying for the internet, right? <laughs> uh, or or putting food on the table. Uh, so we're advocating for uh, access and availability, uh, adequacy, right? 
in terms of, of speed and bandwidth, uh, as well as affordability uh, for all sort of classes of, of uh, citizens. Uh, we are encouraged by uh, a couple of uh, FCC programs uh, that have recently been included in the, the rescue plan, uh, including uh, uh, sort of in addition to the lifeline program, which offers uh, sort of subsidized uh, uh, high speed Internet uh, uh, at a subsidized rate to individuals or families that are eligible, like on food stamps and so on and so forth. Uh, they also added uh, sort of a, a, a rebate or a discount on hardware devices up to $100 for devices that cost anywhere from $120 to uh, uh, $150. Uh, so with a maximum of uh, between $10 or $20 to, to $50 out of pocket expense. I think this is, this, is, this is encouraging. That's the first time that FCC uh, does something like this. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, Congress is paying more and more attention to uh, the uh, country's overall broadband infrastructure, uh, including in rural areas. So we're encouraged by that. We are still advocating, for example, in rural areas for home health care providers uh, to get uh, subsidies from the FCC's universal fund. Uh, and pay a similar price as their hospital and nursing home counterparts who because currently they are not right they're they're uh, they're charged much higher rates because they're not considered a health care provider mm -hmm. uh, right so that's that's one thing that we are advocating we're advocating for uh, affordable housing uh, sort of uh, government funded affordable housing to have uh, funds available to outfit the whole building and make the internet available to all the residents, as well as uh, the staff, like, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, service coordinators, if they have service coordinators, those people need uh, need access to the internet to be able to connect their residents to the uh, appropriate resources, whether it's meals on wheels or uh, transportation for medical appointments and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it we, sh we cannot just rely on someone having internet adequate internet connectivity in their unit. Uh, where, whereas others and the rest of the building, the common areas, for example, do not right. So that's another another area that we're we're advocating for. On the the telehealth front, uh, we are uh, sort of uh, advocating with CMS and uh, CMMI to uh, encouraging them to keep some of the restrictions that were waived. Uh, keep keep some of the waivers. I mean, uh, of some of the restrictions that were uh, available prior to the pandemic. Like, for example, uh, the patient's home, regardless of where it is, whether it's in, in an assisted living unit, in a skilled nursing unit, uh, in a rural or urban area to be an eligible originating site. Uh, right? Uh, but again, uh, that's necessary, but not enough, because guess what, uh, Dean? Uh, you mentioned that uh, they would get reimbursement. The physician, the remote physician would get the reimbursement, mm. but the facility or the community would not get anything mm. uh, except if they had a grant, right? So, for example, FCC also, uh, I have to acknowledge that they had a telehealth grant program uh, during the pandemic that allowed some providers to uh, upgrade their internet connectivity and purchase some of those uh, telehealth uh, equipment or social connectedness equipment that could be leveraged for, for telehealth. Uh, but moving forward, right, once that grant runs out, uh, we also need to acknowledge that those providers need to get some sort of, uh, we need to increase the originating site facility fee, uh, for example, in skilled nursing facilities. We need to have uh, grants and, and programs for training the staff. We need to have uh, sort of subsidies to uh, sort of allow them to get affordable, adequate internet connectivity that can handle telehealth, can handle 
sharing information uh, with other providers uh, over the national health information network or health information exchange entities and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. that's another area where we are again uh, looking at uh, finally uh, providing incentives for long term post acute care to have the appropriate health IT like electronic health records that are that can exchange information and interoperable with the hospitals and the physicians EHRs because uh, those last two types of, of providers received uh, health IT adoption incentives and have certification programs sort of relevant to their lines of business whereas the long-term post-acute care and behavioral health did not right so we're trying to make make it a more uh, uh, of a uh, level playing field, so to speak, and to bring up our sector, our long term post acute care up to par as an active participant in the overall healthcare ecosystem. Maj, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, you know, and this is a little bit of a sidebar and I don't mean to throw you a curveball here, but, uh, you know, as, as I put on my technology solution provider hat, you know, I wonder, does Leading Edge have or the cast, uh, do you guys have resources that technology solution providers can tap into to get a better understanding of how to go after government grants or, you know, some of the funding that might be out there to enable some of these technology implementations? Uh, do you have those type of resources available? Absolutely we do we have uh, two, two things on the cast uh, pages of the leading age section uh, we have uh, and track uh, grant opportunities uh, as well as a list of foundations that do fund mm. uh, such initiatives we have a monthly e-newsletter that we sent out to members and uh, uh, we normally highlight uh, these opportunities when they when they arise uh, the other thing um, I, I mentioned, if you remember, uh, that we have the uh, technology planning and selection tools. Mm -hmm. uh, these are uh, sort of geared or, or focused on different technology sort of uh, areas. Like, for example, there is one for electronic health records, mm -hmm. one for telehealth, one for uh, safety, one for social connectedness. But each one of those tools has a comprehensive white paper that not only talk about the technology, uh, the types of functionalities and features that providers are looking for and the evidence of efficacy and cost effectiveness of available solutions and the steps, the planning steps that a provider needs to take, uh, think about, but also about available payment or reimbursement or subsidy streams, how to correctly uh, ascribe and calculate or estimate the ROI of the investment. So, for example, again, of telehealth, we used to hear, oh, it's going to save uh, save you as a long term post acute care provider a ton of money on uh, a reduction of uh, hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That saves the hospital uh, the penalty on hospital readmissions in, in, in uh, mostly and saves the payer. It doesn't save the long term post acute care provider. If, it, if, if there are other sort of uh, uh, ROI, maybe less tangible ROIs that we need, we as long term post acute care providers need to look at. So we walk you through all of these intricacies and there is an online calculator template that uh, the scan foundation has put out there that we link to. So we make it easy for it's like someone who is holding your hand, whether you're a provider and want to go through uh, this exercise and plan yourself or whether you're a vendor who uh, is in this space, but do not understand all the intricacies of the available funding reimbursements and regulatory uh, constraints that could be out there. Right, and we have a lot of also a lot of uh, educational sessions. We have two events, uh, at least annually, at Leading Age, and one event that CAST takes the lead on in partnership and collaboration with other long-term post-acute care associations. Uh, our partners on the LTPAC Health IT uh, Collaborative, uh, and so on and so forth. So I would encourage your members to uh, and your vendors to take a look at those resources. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage them if they have an offering, it's free to participate and be listed and get 
sort of selected potentially, right, by mm -hmm. our members who use these tools frequently, uh, and and they they tell us they love them. They 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 save they save them uh, tens of thousands of dollars and months upon months of time uh, when they're embarking on a, a technology planning. Uh, project. Yeah, that's awesome because, you know, I was perusing the site. There is a lot of information there, toolkits. Uh, thanks, Maj, for, for painting that picture because I think that's important for technology solution providers. Again, if you're interested in this space or uh, we've, we've talked a lot about the opportunities, they are there. They're going to be there for the next, you know, when you consider our population, the age of our population. Yeah, people are going to stop getting old. They're not going to stop getting <laughs> old. There's not going to be a, a, a stop for a need of technology, right? But, but I love about what Leading Edge does is they help educate the providers. They help educate the, the solution providers. They can connect the dots with some of the funding, which obviously at the end of the road, right, you, you have to get paid for these types of things. And then I love where you ended it there. If you want, you can become a, com a member of the community, uh, you know, have a voice in, in the Leading Edge and become a solution provider. So uh, anyway, I'm glad we had this conversation yeah. around all well, that. Well, guess what? You guys already did the value to the bar for us. Oh, right I know. There. Dang. We just did it, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> Hey, it's fine. <laughs> it's it's it, it was a very organic part of the conversation. So there I you appreciated go. that. Yeah, so yeah. no, I think that's that's extremely good stuff. And yes, that is the takeaway I think for our VARs and yeah. ISVs and the audience is to understand like, hey, again, like a lot of things, this isn't something you have to go it alone. You don't have to try to figure out how to reinvent the wheel in these spaces. If you are mm -hmm. working with these customers already in some way or another, or even if you're not, I mean there's opportunities for digital signage, dedicated mobile devices, scanners, mm -hmm. networking, security. Everything a lot that we of this, do. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that our bars play in, I promise you there is probably somewhere that fits in to the senior aging services, long-term care facility picture that, that there's no reason for you not to go out and have these conversations. 100%. And if you're looking for where to start... I uh, you know, as, as Maj noted, there's plenty of great resources on Leading Age. I will link to all that stuff, by the way, in the show mm -hmm. notes so that you can find some of those sites and see that stuff. But don't hesitate to, to connect with them and reach out and find out. Maj, what were you going to say? I was going to say that that that's not all the 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 icing on the cake is that every year uh we add a new area of uh sort of selection tool we add a new selector tool at least one so uh, another one that that bubbled uh to the priority list this year is infection control right mm -hmm. uh whether whether we're talking about uh clinical decision support systems uh, sort of embedded in your electronic health record and and point of care system to uh, hygiene monitoring hand hygiene monitoring devices to uh, some of the uh, temperature scanning and and visitor control uh, uh, at, to to the to the community and 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 so on contact tracing you name it right so there is always something we're always adding new uh, technologies and we're keeping those those tools up to date. We update them at least once annually. Uh, so the, these are the two uh, things. So if even if you've visited those those tools and used them a few years ago, uh, I believe that you will be pleasantly surprised to see the additions, the changes, the expansions, and the uh, the new questions and new features and functionalities that we hear from our members uh, they're seeking or 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 uh, asking their vendors about. That's awesome. That's great stuff. Like I said, I will put those links in the show notes so you can find that stuff. Again, this is one great. of those places where, hey, I know that people in sales, one of the toughest things sometimes is figuring out where to get started and the resources you need. You don't find too many opportunities to find a bundle of resources right <laughs> at your fingertips. They are right here. Take advantage of them. There you go. Uh, hey, before we get to our What's Tech Connect with you, I do want to, as always, thank our Tech Connect members that make this show possible. Ze Zebra, Elo, Epson, Honeywell, thank you so much for your support of the show. We could not do this without you. We couldn't have great guests like uh, Maj Don with there us today. There you go. Right. Hey, if you are watching the show on YouTube right now, hit the like button. Assuming you liked the episode, we know you did. Uh, <laughs> subscribe to Blue Star's YouTube channel. Always so that you know when new episodes are coming out or any other cool, fun stuff that we do here around Blue Star. We're doing a lot of great stuff with video these days. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, Give us a five-star rating review. Tell us what you think of the show. We might read some of those on air. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to hear from you. Uh, and, of course, as always, if you want to reach out to us, if you have any thoughts about future topics you want us to cover, you can find us on Twitter at TechConnectPod. You can also email us, techconnect at bluestarinc.com.
All right. Well, hey, let's wrap up then with our favorite segment of each week. What's yes, tech connecting with you? This yeah, because we already did the value to the we bar. We did. We kind of covered If you that. don't have any value off of what Maj was telling you today, then oh my. Maybe you shouldn't even be in the business. Right? Uh, not in healthcare, that's for sure. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so this is a segment where we get to talk about something in the world of science, technology, innovation, anything that's kind of caught our eye that we're enjoying playing yep. with, maybe a cool story we're reading about. Yep. Maj, I'll let you start here. What's tech connecting with you right now? Well, I'm I'm very uh, health conscious, uh, and I, I I love these wearable devices, especially in, in the new versions of these. Uh, this one, for example, uh, takes my body temperature every ten minutes, uh, my heart rate, uh, my sleep, my blood pressure, and uh, it sort of uh, gives me information about how I'm exercising, right? Um, if I'm, when I'm doing exercise and so on and so forth. I would love, to, I think this is going to be here to stay as well. I, it's going to contribute to uh, telehealth applications and monitoring uh, for uh, biometrics uh, for, for the management of onset or management of chronic conditions. Uh, I would love to see more open APIs for these so that we can tap into them uh, rather than sort of uh, uh, have a, an army of de developers trying to, to access the data and, and uh, crack that nut. I believe that's going to be, that's going to revolutionize the next generation of biometric remote patient monitoring, uh, frankly, especially with the younger generation who are sort of, again, uh, uh, younger, older adults, the, 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 the X geners and, and, uh, millennials. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I wouldn't be a, a roboticist if I didn't mention some robotic applications. I am, I, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, we're starting to see some of the, uh, service robots, uh, make it into households and make it even into. Uh, mm -hmm. facilities. I believe that uh, those pot can potentially reduce the demand on on uh, labor. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, sort of uh, optimistic. The third category of, of robotic applications uh, that I've been a fan of and I've been sort of uh, monitoring is exoskeletal uh, robot, mm -hmm. robotic suits. Uh, which are now sort of being developed primarily for uh, sort of military applications for the super soldier, so to speak. But uh, they have a lot of potential uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, they have what, what I call or what control people call shared control, right? It's not the robot is not making all the decisions. The robot mm -hmm. is responding to your body movement and your sort of activation signals from your, your, your brain, right? Uh, uh, firing certain muscles. Uh, number two, they can be used by both uh, older adults uh, as well as caregivers. Caregivers as a multiplier of strength and stability, uh, right, for helping someone off the ground, right? One person uh, lift or assist as opposed to a two-person uh, assist or having to bring a Hoyer lift. Uh, the older adult, uh, they could be used as an assistive device to help mm -hmm. someone who has been wheelchair bound to walk mm -hmm. on their own, uh, or uh, even as a short term rehab after a stroke to help someone regain their function and become independent again on their own. So these are some of the things that are sort of floating, yeah. floating somewhere here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm watching all of these spaces. We cool love the stuff. robotics. Yeah. We, we've talked about, well, the wearables. I mean, yeah, wait, right. We right. got that. And we we love that. We're all on board with that. Uh, love on, on the robotics. So I got to ask you a question then, Maj. When are, because we've often talked about when are we going to have that, as, the robotic assistant in our house that's like, you know, cleaning the kid and mopping the floor right. and taking out the trash? I mean, are we like, are, is it going to happen in our lifetime? In other words, when or... do you get to start shirking your duties? Yes. Yeah. When do I get to sh start shirking my <laughs> duties? I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I thought we were going to be the Jetsons by now, that we would have that robot in the house. But how you far away are we? you got to find a more modern much? reference in the Jetsons. I do. You know? I do. Well, there isn't one. <laughs> well, right. well I, 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 think, I think it's coming, but it's probably going to be uh, 
probably going to be 15 years. I don't want to be oh, as optimistic as I used to be. Okay. Uh, as optimistic as I used to be. It, it's related to, uh, to, to uh, three areas of development. Number one, uh, batteries and, and capacity of batteries and capacity or sort of uh, ratio to the size and, and weight of the battery, right? That's number one, mm -hmm. right? Uh, weight of weight and strength of material because you want you want sort of to 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 hold and and lift right, right? we're not Got talking it. about just a platform with it with a flimsy tray that you can put a kind of coke yeah, on right we're talking about about structure. right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so so that's the third area is uh, again related to uh power to to size ratio of actuators motors right mm. uh, and again i believe that we're, we're we're getting there uh but it's to make it affordable uh it's gonna take a long time oh, right? right i i, I think the I, I think tesla tesla is 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 sort of uh, paving the way with the batteries uh, but we will see, definitely we will see uh, sort of self-driving cars, fully self-driving cars uh, before yeah. anything else. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. We've talked many, many times about that. I, I'm more of a believer that I probably will get in a self-driving car before I'll have... Well, he broke the, your heart about the rest of it, What was the right? Jetsons robot? Was that Ro Alice or something? Ro was Rosie? Was Rosie. 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 Yeah. Before I have Rosie. my own Rosie. 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 Oh, yeah. well. You know, maybe someday. But I'll tell you what. All right. So so I, I got one for you. Uh, are you sick and tired? Or do you recycle? Yeah, let's put it that yes. way. Yeah. And how much of your recycled elements do you think actually get not recycled? Enough. I, I, there was a, a John Oliver episode not too long back that kind of dove into that. And, right. And how and absurdly you. small amount. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things like you still want to do it, but unfortunately, no, right. very, very little of it actually so, gets recycled. Okay. So this is plastic specifically. It's about 10% that actually get yeah. recycled. And, you know, there's, and, and it's, it's an issue because there's an expense around recycling that. But so that's why this headline grabbed me. The future looks bright for infinitely recyclable plastics. A new environmental and technological analysis suggests that a revolutionary eco-friendly plastic is almost ready to hit the shelves. So it's, this isn't like going to happen maybe sometime. Right. It's almost ready to hit the shelves now. It is called PDK. Uh, I'm not even going to pronounce the, the scientific <laughs> polydiathlon. <laughs> just just uh, don't. Come on. There you go. Try. The material, you can read it. Yeah, it's all right. You're really good at that stuff. The material... <laughs> Um, has all the convenient properties properties of traditional plastic while avoiding the environmental pitfalls because uh, be, because unlike traditional plastics, PDKs can be recycled indefinitely with no loss of quality. So anyway, they get into the it is a chemical process, which I'm a little bit like, eh, what's this? Where they you know they use a chemical acid to break down, but apparently these monomers, you know, they're not polymers, they're monomers. You can just infinitely keep reshaping them, reforming nice. them, as opposed to the way they're doing it right now, which is you got to heat it up you got to destroy it and right, then right. You, only so much of that so anyway keep your eye out for pdk plastics this might be the revolution that makes plastics infinitely recyclable so that when you do throw it away it's actually meaningful like you're and doing then, something yeah yes and that rumkey's not just charge or whoever your trash exactly. is not just charging you a bunch of money to do something that they're actually not doing much of bingo so keep recycling pdks then it'll be even more all meaningful right. what's going on with you john uh hey have you ever thought about how in the world do you do laundry in space Okay, how the heck do you then? Not something I'd really thought about, but it makes sense. I'm especially so like curious for... how they go to the bathroom in space. But now we're talking about well, laundry. That's right? a whole different thing. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why are you or always sleeping. interested in what's going on in the bathroom? Or sleeping, so, even. How do you sleep in space? So, well, let's just get to the laundry problem first. Okay. Because, again, it wasn't something I really thought about. But, you how know, do you, you have a lot of astronauts, like yeah. at the ISS, that spend a lot of time in space. I'm sure they don't want to wear funky clothes every day that start smelling bad after a while. Space they, cycles they sweat. hard without gravity. Well, here's the other thing, too, <laughs> and I didn't think about this before. The space station, for instance, has a closed loop water system. So it's intended not to be able to be something that's accessible to be used oh. and then, re you know, because it's a recyclable closed loop system that's for specific functions. Okay. So. Uh, naturally, Procter & Gamble, which is a local company to us yes. here in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. has been working with NASA. And, of course, Tide is going to be course. the one that does this. Yes. So, basically, Tide has come up with versions of Tide pens and wipes 
which can remove odors and stains from clothing without requiring washing machines or any interference with the water systems. NASA and Tidal begin testing them as early as 2022 uh, and sees an important role for the innovation in future space and exploration endeavors, which will see humanity begin colonizing the moon and Mars. Oh, see, for you, it always comes back to going to Mars. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right, but so. I mean, yeah, it's again, one of those things like, duh, you can't just, you don't, you, well, you can't, because before this, they were sending people up with like excess clothing. Ah. And, you know, if you're going to send somebody into space, every bit of extra weight, rather, you know, even just yeah. a few extra pieces of clothing oh, sure. is extra fuel that you have to expend, Absolutely, extra sure. money you have to spend just right. to get that vessel moving and heading into space. Yeah. So this could helpfully resolve that problem where they could have one, maybe two sets of clothes and actually be able to clean them and reuse them. And not need the Febreze in, in the <laughs> cockpit, you know, because I do wonder whether like, what does it smell like? Up I, there, you now know? I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, when you yeah. have a group of people that are up there. So the air is recycling, the water is recycling. Yeah. Oh, boy. But Without a lot of the niceties for a long time, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, I, I've heard some stories about some astronauts coming back from, you know, one from ones that have been like sure. in, in the in ISS probes. for a while. Well, not even oh. the ISS, but just in spaceships and probes and, mm -hmm. you know, and coming back and, you know, it's a little bit funky when they pop that door open. So. But they also say that the Earth, you know, has a, a unique odor to that's it. That's true. So, but anyway, yeah. That's very true. Oh, so, there you go. Okay. All right. So, we got laundry solved. Yes. Got it. So, the lesson Check. here is today our robot maids are coming soon. <laughs> no, but 15 not soon years enough. Away. Right. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. soon enough for Dean. <laughs> right. And uh, and we can wash our clothes in space when it's that time. So, Bingo. Dr. Mars Dalwin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, today. We Maj. appreciate having you on the show. <laughs> thank you. It was fun. Thank you for having me. All right. Hey, until next time, folks, please stay connected. Built with versatility in mind, ELO Edge Connect offers a wide assortment of peripheral options for your digital display. Whether for endless aisle, self-order, or collaboration, you can seamlessly attach up to four peripherals to the touchscreen edge with flexibility to add, remove, or change later as needed. Options include barcode scanners, EMV cradle, customer-facing display, webcams, and more. To learn more, visit ELO's microsite on bluestarinc.com or contact your Bluestar account manager. Delivering high-quality patient care starts by connecting data from admissions to discharge and every step in between. Zebra's patient identity management solutions enable precision when matching patient records, medication, specimens, and more. So the right patient gets the right care every time. Built from a connected ecosystem of scanners, printers, and supplies to help ensure treatments and medications are accurately administered, Zebra's patient identity solutions give clinicians the performance edge they need to deliver safe and accurate care. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes or contact the Blue Star Zebra team.